Ready? Okay. Okay, at 7.01, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Um, the first point on the agenda is questions or comments from the floor. Are there any? No. Thank you. Then we'll move into presentations. And the first presentation is the CSI project presentation. <laughs> Take it away, CSI project. <laughs> introduction. These are our computer science interns this year. They've been working on their uh, big projects. We have Connor Ambridge, who will be graduating this year. We have AJ Perosi. They've both been working in Unity on um, and getting some intensive training from our BOCES liaison, uh, Dylan Tomry, who's been working with them the past couple of months. And of course, we have our in-house musician, uh, Grayson, who uh, will do a little serenading but, uh, with what he's created on the 3D printer this year. Create built that from a 3D printer. Yeah, that's think that one that's made like that could ever approach the quality of sound in a wooden fiddle? Um, I don't think so. I think that it's, it's a lot of trouble to match this sound with a wooden violin or fiddle. Um, because the problem with this is I could split it in half when I print it, but the body was printed in one piece and there's uh, supports inside of this. Um, so it's not completely hollow. So there's not um, there's no like reverb inside of the uh, the violin. So it doesn't really make the full sound. Um, but you could get the printer to if you split it in half, you could take the supports out, or you could get the printer to um, uh, print this without fill, um, supports. So that's there's a higher likelihood likelihood um, for the the print to collapse and through the print because there's no supports holding everything up. Um, but if you do get lucky, you could get a full body printed without supports, but it might take a lot longer. And I, I feel that this is um, 
I think that making a wooden violin, although it's very expensive still, would probably be easier and more accessible to um, you know, create. It's like, say, if you needed beginner violins, I think a wooden violin would still be uh, way more accessible um, and easier to do. I just want to say it's very, uh, we appreciate your perseverance in getting, yeah. to, getting the product done. said, uh, AJ and I have been working in Unity, which is a video game design sort of like platform. Uh, last year, I was working in Game Maker, and I kind of, I made, I made a game in there, and once that end of the year came, I, Miss Jones, felt that we needed to step up and get, get into more advanced levels for uh, video game design. So, she went ahead and persevered and got us Unity. And we couldn't be more thankful for that one because <laughs> Unity is a lot of fun to work with. Uh, AJ, what do you think your favorite thing in Unity is so far? I think just having everything be so orderly. What is it's really easy to work with. Could you speak a little louder? I'm sorry. Yeah, everything in Unity is very orderly, so it's very easy to work with. It's much more efficient than Game Maker. Okay. Uh, I, think, I think one of my favorite things in Unity is... is uh, Probably, probably just the interface. It's a lot, yeah, like AJ said, it's a lot more, it's a lot cleaner to use, a lot more organized, and there's there's a lot more that you can do with it. Like Game Maker is strictly like 2D sprites and stuff like that. With Unity, I can make 3D games and all that sort of stuff and get into even higher level worth of like video game design. And I, in fact, actually got Unity for the summer for me to work on, so I can do some stuff with that. And I'm very excited. You know, I guess I'm more grateful that Mr. Jones helped us and got that for us. And Mr. Tom. And Mr. Tom Ray, thank you so much for helping me with coding. I no, had no idea how to code at all before he showed up. Thank you when he came when he did. The, the most important thing for me is that Warner Brothers James that we visited last year said, if you want to work for us, when you come to the interview, you need to come with a game that you've created in a professional platform like Unity. Uh, so we got it, and I turned it loose on them. And when they graduate, they can now, if they want a job, could go to Warner Brothers with a game that they've created. I did not help them. <laughs> not at all. Um, if you didn't get a chance there out front, they'll also be there at the Maker Fair if you want to try out one of their games. AJ's, I think, is particularly aggravating, <laughs> where Connors is, uh, the graphics are really cute. So. Nice. How many how many people do you figure are playing the game now on your platform? Ooh, um, well, I, I, well, obviously I can't release it to the public because I, I need uh, certain stuff for that. And uh, but I, I've had people test it in school before, so I've, I've had like probably over a dozen people test my game. They left feedback, give me comments, and but for like for like a, maybe like a week or two after after me testing my game to students. Uh, I took their suggestions and I improved my game. In fact, like my, my enemies before were just like this orange circle. Now they're a fried egg. So. <laughs> well, congratulations and good luck. Thank you. When you go to Warner Brothers. Thank you guys for stopping right. in. Okay, the next uh, presentation is classroom departmentalization. Hi, um, so this evening <laughs> I brought um, along, I have two parts to our presentation. The first part is um, our fifth grade team. Uh, they put together a presentation for you. And then I also have a second part. I, I went around and videotaped some students, asked them some questions about what how they feel about departmentalization, and I put together like a short um, presentation, and I made sure the speaker works this time so you can all hear it. Um, but I want to say thank you because this year has been tremendous. We've had such an awesome year, and um, I'm really excited to see our data, whether it's discipline data or New York State assessment data. It's been just a really tremendous year. So. Um, and they're a tremendous team. Also tonight, Carrie Powers will be presenting, and she has been um, one of our <laughs> yearly appointments of um, for AIS, but she is gonna be, um, she, uh, we're recommending her for a position full-time school district. So 
So, anyways, enjoy. And last year we did the first grade, and this year we did the fifth. So we went from the bottom to the top. In terms of, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. Not bottom. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Not, not, not literally. We got the worst to the best. <laughs> I'm Anne Marie Craig, I'm Social City Science for fifth grade. Ashley Eckert, Math for fifth grade. Claudia Morris, ELA. Natalie Bowerman, Special Ed. And Harry Powers, AIS. Okay, so we're going to just give you some information about how we use departmentalization and the way that we work together as a team. Excuse me, can I just that you move a little closer <laughs> just so you can hear better? Thank you. So these are our five C's of fifth grade. These are the traits we try to incorporate into our planning, our team time, our curriculum, everything that we are going to use. So we use collaboration. We, are, we work together to resolve every behavior issue at a struggling learner. Everything that we do, we collaborate with each, with each other. And it ends up being more beneficial to have multiple people seeing this child. And you can come up with many different ways to help them or find different ways to support them, figure out what works, what doesn't. Um, and we are all consistent. Everything that you see in our rooms is going to happen consistently throughout. What you see in my room is going to be the same as Mrs. Morris, the same as Mrs. Craig's. All our expectations are uniform throughout. We have to use creativity because we have limited time with our students, so we are making sure that we are able to plan fun and engaging activities. For example, you'll hear more about our inter interdisciplinary projects that incorporate all of the subjects. And we really just, we communicate with each other on everything. What we plan, our lessons, our AIS, projects that we do, we are making sure that we check in together. We check in between classes, and if there's an issue that hasn't risen, we take care of it and make sure that we're all on the same page. And we really just have compassion for ourselves and for the students to make sure that we are there for each other. We're supporting everybody, the kids, and we're just working together. Um, I think, as you know, we are departmentalized grades one through five, um, and we find a lot of positive aspects about that. Um, we focus on one subject. If we're lucky, we get to teach the subject that we love, um, so I think that aids in creativity. Um, we have a greater level of expertise and a deeper understanding. Um, there's consistency for the instruction across the whole grade, and at, along with that, every subject gets the same amount of instructional time each day. Because it's a little easy when you're in your own room to kind of dip into math time if you didn't finish this book or this writing piece. So now there's a time allotted for every subject. Um, and our rooms are themed. Uh, if you come into my room, obviously there's all types of VLA um, posters and, and things. Um, our furniture, uh, Anne Marie has been the first one and Donna Lee have, have gotten their new furniture. And you walk into Anne Marie's room and it's a science room. There's the tables. Um, she has all kinds of animals and compost and all kinds of science compost. things. Um, <laughs> but, and um, Ashley and I are um, on tap for the next year <laughs> furniture. Um, data. We think data, looking at data is more meaningful when you're, one, when you're looking at the whole grade level as the ELA teacher or the math teacher, so on. Um, it's easier to in adjust your instruction based on the data you're seeing and also you are the person who will um, give suggestions to the other teachers as to what they do in the AIS time for that subject. Um, teacher uh, relationships, teacher, 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 student. Um, as Ashley mentioned, we're there for each other. We have support, whether it's in our professional lives or our personal lives. We also know when we need to give each other space. Um, <laughs> Which is sometimes. Um, we, we communicate constantly. I mean, when we say constantly, we truly mean that. Like right in between classes, you know, when we're switching, we have maybe a minute and a half, and, we and we're, we're communicating. Together. We eat Every lunch, day. Eat lunch plan, um, texting at night. It's, it's, it's really, we're not exaggerating. Um, because we need that. We need that to keep it consistent. Uh, we collaborate to make grade level decisions and to perform the responsibilities we have to. Um, as far as the students, they're all of our kids. We are invested in all of them, and we take equal responsibility for their success. Um, and the teachers, the students have many teachers to build relationships with. You know, sometimes there's a student or two that you just don't feel like you make a deep enough connection with in your homeroom, but the child has the option of having other teachers that they could maybe connect with. Um, and we think it's just an easier transition to middle school. 
Uh, they learn how to pass classes um, easier. They learn to work with different teachers and uh, teachers with different learning styles throughout the day, and they learn to adjust. They have to adjust from one period to the other. Because even though we do a lot of things the same, we're still different people and have different styles. So we think that that helps the children um, adapt easier. Challenges, yes, there are challenges. Um, like really? Mm -hmm. But we learned, <laughs> yeah, and we've grown from that. Um, the tuna teacher relationship. Uh, we can build relationships with so many more kids throughout the year that we wouldn't have had the opportunity to do before. Um, the consistency. We've built a camaraderie that we have been able to um, get on the same page with our rules and um, how we handle given situations. And when we're not sure, we check in before we go forward because we want it to be as consistent as it possibly can be. Um, and it's a give and take. Um, we don't always agree. We don't have the same visions. We're different people. We have different ex levels of experience. We have different backgrounds. We're all different ages. So we come at things from a different place. But sometimes we, and we disagree. But sometimes you have to give in. Because at the end of it, it's about what's best for the kids. So we, you give in, and um, if we just make it work. So just to wrap up, we <laughs> did share some pictures of like specific things that are in each of our rooms, depending on what subject we teach. So at the top, you can see some, we have some math and ELA boards that are specific there. And then I did a picture of the furniture showing how it is amazing to have tables while doing labs. And the opportunity to do labs in a fifth grade classroom, I think, is awesome. She mentioned before, so Ms. Zeher had mentioned before that we had done projects together. Um, so even though we're all teaching our own subjects, um, we did take time to plan projects together where we did come together. We worked in the hallway, the rooms all intermingled with each other. Um, we planned three interdisciplinary projects this school year. We used information that we've actually learned at the Learning 2025 Summit. So it was kind of neat to learn something over the summer and bring it back and actually try it out in our classrooms. Um, while we watched and observed the students working, we saw they were always engaged. Um, it really taught them how to work well with each other. We had lots of disagreements the first project that we did, and they persevered right through it and worked through it. And I think really learned by the second project, oh, they're not going to come in and solve our problems for us. We have to do it ourselves. Um, and then it reinforced that even though we are departmentalized, all the subjects still come together. Um, and in a moment, you're going to see what the projects look like for us. So this summer, we did, um, or we are planning to meet again, change up some things we realized maybe didn't work, but also plan a fourth project as well. Okay. And those projects are over a couple of weeks long. Oh, yeah. During um, the end of, the, of each quarter. Yes. So when you really look at it, there's eight or ten weeks yes. that you guys are doing cross-curricular stuff. Yes, and we designated, we designated Fridays usually were our days where we would still rotate for like about a 30-minute block. So we still kind of wrapped up. That was usually when assessments and things were given. And then for like an hour and a half of our Friday, we opened our doors, opened our rooms, and the kids just moved freely. And like I said, we did it over a couple of weeks, like quite a few weeks. Uh, the first project that we did this year Hatchet's one of the novels that we start with in ELA, um, and Hatchet, the setting, is in Canada. Well, for social studies, we do geography, specifically Western Hemisphere. So we were able to make a map, and then we even got math included in where they made a scale based on measurement. Um, project number two was I did Ancient Civilizations, where they studied um, Mayan, Aztec, and Incan civilizations. They wrote a narrative to go along with those specific civilizations. They did a specific like rope beaded activity with decimals, and then we even included special area teachers. So they did a music ensemble and a mask making. And then Project Three we haven't gotten to yet. <laughs> so like a sneak peek, um, if you come to our moving up ceremony, you will see it. It'll be um, they'll do a poster board, and they're actually going to solve real life problems, come up with a solution based on environmental issues that they see around us. And then, so this one's just silly. We did, um, we presented this before as well to East Hill as a, as a whole. 
and we thought it would be fun to ask students if a teacher in another grade asked you if they should do a similar group project with their students, what would you honestly say? And so one student all for it, yes, you can have new experience and get to work with partners and learn new things. Well, then some students were like, no, <laughs> didn't like it. Um, but it was good to learn how to work with other people. And then I included, again, some of the images of the things the students had done for each of the projects. So, it's me. Um, so for AAS, just in general, it's the small group interventions um, that we use um, based on various data points, benchmarking, um, classroom data, and then our own AIS progress monitoring are the main um, data points that we collect and talk about every month when we meet, um, rotating between math and ELA, where we collect the data, look at it, analyze it, um, regroup students if we feel need to based on skills not met or skills needed for intervention. And then we pick those targeted skills to then do the interventions on before the next meeting. Um, and then also what we did and collaborated, I think, very well on this year. Um, I know Alicia's excited. I think we all are for the summer results, <laughs> um, for the state tests, um, because the kids did so wonderful. But I think it really was a team effort. Um, we used um, pre-release exams um, for math. We did it um, in the AIS in classroom. We started back in December where it was just like one or two problems integrated into just instruction so it was not a stressful environment. Um, I tracked and data tracked the fourth grade who did an AS block release test, and then Ashley had done the fifth grade re release test um, in instruction and did data analysis. So, come February, when we were closer to really kind of dive into test prep, we had information and data, and we regrouped all of our groups to saying if they need fraction help, they're going with you. If they need decimal re intervention, they need you. If they just need basic math concepts over here, algebra, another group. Um, so, we really honed in and targeted the math skill set, um, like I said, when we got closer, and then um, Claudia and I did it a little differently. She did it as a homework, just to take a you know, little passage home, answer the questions, um, but then she was doing data analysis off of that, to which we then took, well, what the, like, theme became a really important one to re-go, um, mean idea detail, so there was still just some couple of things, um, skill sets that we still had to really hone in on and intervent, again, to get them prepared to take their grade level examination with confidence, which I really do think, like, that was like one of the nicest things I've seen in a long time is they, were, they weren't like overly excited, <laughs> but they weren't coming in with dread and stress and anxiety. They were prepared and ready to take the test. Um, and then recently, we just did our last kind of collaboration um, with the Lemonade War. It's a novel that I met with Claudia on when we were talking about year-end chapter books just to kind of do during the AS blocks. Um, it's like an end-of-the-year application to the bigger pictures instead of small targeted skill sets. And we picked the Lemonade War, and it ended up being something that we're doing as a whole grade. Um, <laughs> yep. And we had a reading journal, um, and then also it turned into the Math AAS block. We made a lemonade stand, which will have lemonade for our end of the year celebration that they created. Um, so that's kind of like holistically, um, but for the math block, it's 40 minutes every day. Depending on different schedules, it's not every day for every kid, um, but mainly a four out of five days. For me, what really popped that still needed intervention at the lowest level was fact fluency, multi-digit multiplication, long division, rounding, and fractions was like a big chunk of our time um, that we really like standard spiral down to like the third grade, fourth grade. And like I said, we went through and um, based on Ashley's um, classroom data, and then like I said, what we were seeing is that in all AIS blocks, we divided and conquered that too to really specifically target where kids were and group them based on um, their needs that way. And then same thing I already talked about New York test prep um, for ELA, 60 minutes daily, and that was mainly a comprehension focus. Like I said, main idea, details, inference, and theme were the biggest ones that I started the year with, and then we re, um, came in for like sequencing and cause and effect for the other ones. Okay, so with all that, I'm going to share some data, because um, that's what we do. Um, and we did benchmarking from September to January. I did a comparison. So we really just have the math I ready. Um, because I really think, and again, like this is like me being a daddy geek, but I'm excited. Benchmarking's already started. I'm like watching every kid like a hawk, like um, and whatnot. But 11 students, because I think our system does work really, really well. Um, and I've been actually excited. I'm kind of sad that next year I won't be with you guys. <laughs> um, but 
it's really been a cohesive, I think, full and effortly. She said that they're all of our students, um, and it is all in hands on deck mode. So 11 students met their yearly growth in January, um, which I think is pretty significant <laughs> that in a half a year they made a year's worth of growth. Um, 23 students made significant progress um, in the 20 to 99 percent. Um, and then 19 students made less than 20, so they still made growth, but to pull out of that, 15 of those students were on grade level or within a year. So they're not significantly behind not making growth, they're where they're supposed to be making little growth. Um, and we jumped about double from September was 23% to 38% of students are on grade level. So how many students are there? We have flux because we've lost and gotten some kids. So like if it'll be two or three, I feel like we have to be seven. Now. Yeah. yeah I, <laughs> I packed I range from like eight to ten in my groups mm -hmm. and then yeah. Um so for ELA we have the two benchmarks. Um so for IRD though, same thing, 27 students met their yearly growth by January. Um, seven students made it within the significant progress range, and then again, that same number kind of of 19, where the majority of those kids are on grade level or like slightly behind within the year. So the, again, they're close to where they should be, they're just not making as much progress as we want. But like I said, I'm very optimistic that that's gonna, those numbers are gonna change. <laughs> um, but we had 45% of students on grade level or above in January, up from 35. But with that, for ELA, we have the counter, um, the Fontes and Pinnell, reading assessment that I administer <laughs> um, to all 50 plus kids. And so it's a different take because it's in-person, it's not computer-based, it's read a passage, I listen to half of them reading out loud, and then it's just a question, back and forth conversation with the students to kind of analyze how they do with their comprehension of like literal, summarize the text, infer and like make connections to the text, and then just basic like genre, title, comparison. Um, and 13 students are above grade level, 28 are at fifth grade level, um, nine students are below, but again within the year, and then the three students are below within two years. So that came out as 77% of their students in fifth grade are on grade level by mid-year. Um, and what we were really excited about was some of those specific jumps. We had one student jump um, four levels, which is over a year's worth of growth from Jan or September to January. And it is one of the students that was red and has moved solidly to the top end of yellow. And it's almost like I said, I'm excited to do theirs, to have them in the green optimistically um, next month. And then four students, again, jump three levels. So in that um, testing framework, that's a year's growth again in a half a year, then seven students. And then the majority of students made um, a quarter year, but the way F and P's work is that still like progress that they should be making because you can have three to four data points a year. So the levels flux. Um, and then six students, again, demonstrate no progress, but five of those six are on level um, and just stayed where they were. Yes, that's <laughs> um, so I joined the fifth grade team this year, and I have to say that everything they're telling you is true because um, I went to fifth grade knowing nothing about fifth grade curriculum, hadn't taught in the elementary level in over 20 years, and <clears throat> finished out the last year of the behavior classroom self-contained. So the first semester, we were self-contained, and we worked out behaviors, and we did a lot of that stuff, and it got in the way of a lot of things. But I was able to use their pacing calendar that they, that they shared with me. I was able to go on across the hall or next door and say, what are you doing for this topic? And they'd share ideas with me, sometimes share materials with me. That allowed me to um, address the, the biggest bang for your buck standards with these kids and try to keep them moving forward as much as I could while dealing with behavior. Um, they participated with the fifth grade in projects, they go to fifth grade specials, they're in the fifth grade wing, they feel like fifth graders. And I know that was a, a concern in the past because it wasn't always a classroom that had one or two classrooms, you know, grade levels. Sometimes it was a uh, variety and you kind of had to shoot in the middle for specials and things. The kids are with their peers. Um, so that was the first half of the year. <clears throat> and now in the second half of the year, we've gone to more of a co-teach. Every now and then, we still have to pull someone out and deal with things briefly, very briefly. Um, and then we go right back at it. But um, these aren't my kids in this grade. These are our kids. And I never have had someone say in this, this uh, level, oh, your kid did this or your kid did that. We're all talking about all the kids. And um, <clears throat> 
My kids um, moved into their classrooms flawlessly. They were welcome from day one, talking about where's the best place to seat them, how can we help you to help them. Um, I've never been more welcomed by a grade level. Um, and my kids. And my throw in it, like it is weird when they don't come to us on a day. Like it yeah. feels yeah. wrong, right? Because it's just with we are a team, and it, it feels weird when one of us isn't there or somebody's yeah. not you know, missing. So, but by being able to <clears throat> try to keep up with their pace and calendar in the first half of the year, it made it so much easier for the kids to go into that coach each month for the second half of the year to prepare for that in sixth grade. And they're they're doing well. They're and they really work. jumped right in, and, and mm -hmm. they participate. They are actively like coming up and answering questions, they are part of that classroom. Yeah. And we also, in, in, as a part of the sixth grade, having kids come and go, my classroom has been almost a revolving door <laughs> of kids moving into the district and moving out. And now we have a couple that have come back around. But um, even with all of that change, it's been fantastic because of all the things that this team took in place. And just to piggyback on that too, thinking that they all are of our kids and they all know that. Because there's no stigma to come to me because I'm down the level. Um, no, like I don't think there's ever been any issue between the flux and the rotation of students that have the needs that require other adults. Like it's just all very much a community mm -hmm. of students getting it done. And an open line of communication. Oh yeah. So the, the children also know, again, even though we're departmentalized, they can't go to Mrs. Yeah. Zachary and oh, say no. something and expect <laughs> to get an answer that they wouldn't get from me yeah. or from Mrs. Morris. Because again, we communicate like crazy yeah. to make sure that it Close. So there no, there's no manipulation of mom and dad or mom oh, no. and dad. <laughs> Not there. It doesn't work with us. <laughs> I can give you an exact example. Like yesterday, it was yesterday, one of the students came down and they were saying something, and one was like, You're not supposed to say that. This is Craig's best. I'm like, Why are you saying it in here? <laughs> like, I'm no different. And they're like, oh, Okay. <laughs> and like, so yeah, I think it is. And they know, because we have this missile together, which I love every day, actually. Um, and they see us. I mean, we're all. Always talking at the end of every day, and I think they think we talk about other stuff, but we actually really are always talking about them. <laughs> I'm like, how do you? Well, because like I have a like, this is what they did for me. How are they doing for you? Have you seen? And it's more of that social emotional support for them too. That I'm like, they kind of were having an issue with me. How's it been going with you? Or the same thing. Hey, they had this rough morning with me. Did they transition okay to you? Like, and stuff. So it's been more to than academic, but just kind of like holistically making sure that they're all taken care of. Um, and if there is a need that it goes and is addressed. How, how are they grouped? Are, are they grouped in like homogeneous grouping or do you have like by levels? Um, or are they mixed together? They're mixed together. And um, our, our classrooms, our core classes are all at grade level. And then when we have our AS classes, that's when we have our small being groups at their level. Okay. Um, now I know you all have had the experience with a traditional fifth grade or elementary model versus what you know the decompartmentalization that you're doing now how do you compare the two experiences in terms of as, as teachers i well i i taught self-contained like yeah. a, a, all subjects for one year and then did departmentalization um of course as a teacher i love teaching everything but i feel like i'm much more effective being departmentalized I have one focus on one subject. I also feel like it makes us a stronger team. And we were still able to, to deal with all the subjects because of our projects. So it was an easy workaround of and, like. Right, and you're still getting, getting an AIS. AIS. Like, even though I teach, yes. math, I'm still getting AIS reading. And maybe we still need to cover science and social studies. Like, we're yes. still getting it all yes. just in different parts of the day. So, would you like, to, like it to continue, I gather? Yes. Okay. <laughs> And another question, what do you think the difference is for the students in this model versus, you know, having one teacher in one classroom all day long? Anything that you notice in terms of students? I think they, from what I've scattered, they enjoy. They enjoy being able to get up and leave um, and go to another atmosphere, see another teacher's face, um, you know, meet with friends a couple minutes in the hall. I think they really enjoy the variety from what I've gathered. I've never heard any student complain about that. Um, I think they enjoy the variety, especially at our level. Mm -hmm. That that would be my next question. Is you know you're at fifth grade, that's when you when you're hoping that the transition is going to be happening into middle school. We hope, um, <laughs> and so 
how is that going from, how, do you see a difference from the fourth to the fifth grade? You know, with the fourth graders, they're, I assume they're doing departmentalization as well. You know, do you see that they can um, have that growth from having it that year into fifth grade so it's not that big of a transition? Well, I can speak to that because I do fourth and fifth. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd say like the fourth grade group is just as, it's it, like the fourth grade to them is wonderful. I mean, I've been so blessed this year with the teams I worked with. Um, Cause it's, I would feel they would have a very similar presentation. Mm -hmm. That communication is always open daily, um, checking in. And the kids, like I said, they're moving, they're coming. Like people who need help that aren't, that are pulled out for that kind of help are not stigmatized. It's just, we're all rotating and we all rotate again. And I think it's helped too with our targeted interventions and our meetings monthly. Even when even those rotation groups change can see like, oh, okay, that person's over here. Like, it's just, it's a natural thing now without like, oh, well, I'm the one with this person. Because I've had that experience where kids mm -hmm. refuse to have, have refused to come into my room. Right. Because they know like, mm -hmm. oh, this is Powers is special. Uh, it, like, yeah. And I don't even know so, if they know that. No, I don't think they do. Like, because <laughs> because my prior grew, experience. Like, especially for math, we yeah. used them based on ability. Yeah. They just knew. Like, and I think the same thing. There, You're Mrs. Mrs. Bowerman. I'm Mrs. Yeah. Powers. Like, we're all just who we are. And it's like, okay, this is where we're going to go for this time frame. And I don't, I don't feel like any of the fifth grade students have looked at my fifth grade students in the self yeah. care room and thought that they were any different. Yeah, they're just in that room right now, mm -hmm. and everybody else goes to different rooms. So it, it didn't feel like anyone was thinking anything other than those are fifth grade kids. Yeah. And what grade level is the departmentalization starting? Grade, grade one, and and is is that like? Difficult for them, you know, as first graders, or do you find that they're just, just in, in general, are are they are they able to handle it? As a, I mean, are yeah. they, yes. <laughs> well, I I think I think they are. I can tell you that I haven't had one parent concern as it relates to That's departmentalization. Um, I can tell you that there's. You know, a couple teachers that have expressed, yeah, if they could have a self contained like their own classroom, mm -hmm. they would prefer that. But like in the first grade team, I could tell you two teachers really love it, and one teacher would love to have her own class, but understands that the positive aspects. Of I'm more concerned about the students. Yeah, and the you students, know. they're, I mean, they're changing rooms with ease. I have videos of them on here mm -hmm. of kids I videoed that responded to me asking them how they like it. Um, I didn't have any of the primary kids tell me they didn't like changing classrooms. Um, so um, so the kids are learning. I guess what I'm asking yeah. is, you know, are they are they learning how to adapt? Are they, you know, so yes. by the time they're in fifth grade, it's kind of like yeah. old hat for oh, yeah. which oh, is, yeah. I would say, even know. from like, okay, so last year we did it, and then to this year, the fifth graders that we have now went through it in fourth grade and came into it knowing how it worked and comfortable with how it worked, I think. I, I don't think, like, it, it was. It was just, oh, this is how it goes, right? Like, this is what we do. This is my home yeah. teacher, but then we're going to jump to the other room. So. Do you think that it helps with like kids who are challenging or maybe more restless yeah. because they mm -hmm. get to yes. get up, mm -hmm. move around, yes. change environments? And it's yeah. even like, I think you had mentioned it, right? Like personality wise, like even as adults we don't get along with, we're not best friends with everybody we meet. And so when they get to move rooms, they get that opportunity also to have a relationship with somebody that they might not see. Well then, do you, do you feel like you're more effective at dealing with challenging students because you're not with them all day, every day? Mm -hmm. So. Yes. <laughs> I've been telling you, I can tell you that, and I shared this in, um, with Mark, I can tell you that like the discipline data specifically this year in terms of overall data number of suspensions are way down, Yeah, like way down in comparison. I think it's a, I think it's a combination of things. I think it's the hard work we did with conscious discipline. We're seeing the fruits of that, but I also think departmentalization plays a role in that too. Yeah. So I think it's a it's a combination of things, but I think departmentalization does help with that too. Mm -hmm. Like I said, for me, I think the biggest thing is I can speak to when we meet as my AAS department with the younger grades. That again, that stigma is not present in Canajary. It is just normal for kids to go somewhere else. 
they aren't coming in or refusing to come in. They aren't feeling bad that they're coming to the different rooms. Um, but also, like, too, within that, um, I think, like, for the, like, speaking of the behaviors, too, is it does give all of us a break, and it gives kids, because I always talk about, too, we'll be like, <laughs> I know it's a little bit more lively in my room, but it's that small, but, like, they're allowed different environments that are conducive to them and their learning. So, like, that it's not stigmatized, and they are meeting what they need. Because, um, like I said, they act, and this is based on our communication open daily, I have some kids that are super quiet, in the, whole, in the classrooms and don't really participate because I'm working with the lower end, but then like in, in my room, they're open and they're having more personality. So it does, like I said, that movement allows kids to be who they need to be and feel successful with different aspects. Are you, and like I said, the environments are becoming very apparent, like small group versus whole group. And then that lets us also too when we go and talk about like special ed referrals or just in the AIS world with groupings of how many kids, you know, like if, because that is part of learning, too, is the social emotional. So if a kid might be doing okay, but we notice, all right, they're not really being productive in a whole class, so they can come to me as well and be in a smaller environment to feel success. Because I feel like that's been our last kid with math um, that we changed groups with. He was struggling in the whole group and not doing so well, and then all of a sudden he came to me, and I was able to give him that more attention, and he's doing great, like, and it's translated back up to the classroom that he's doing better. And I'm like, but he shouldn't really be with me. He knows all the answers. But it's just that his like environment is, makes him more comfortable to be able to be his best self. So, so do you guys have a common planning time, or like well, they do? But I bug them a lot. <laughs> so we have so okay, I just so, show up. <laughs> okay, so I guess what I'm at. So the core teachers have a common planning time, and yes. then the AIS special ed you work in I have there. The same as they do you because do. my kids go with their kids. Okay. Got it. Like so planning lunch. Planning and lunch. But I don't feel that deters us. Like, I'm always. Yeah, oh, you found time. To yeah, I make it. Well. Yeah. And they're like, always happy. Like, I always fun. feel bad for teaching. Like, hey, so what's this like? <laughs> <laughs> All right, bye, guys. And, and I also, my lunch is with their planning. So sometimes we'll just come up and have, like, a working lunch, too, to make it work. An observation. I'm familiar with a local district that's been doing it a little longer. And, um, and I went and talked this week for the whole day. And the different groups, I volunteered to do that. And their model is very successful. The only bump, not the only bump, but the one that stands out to me that they're having, it's a bigger group of teachers, and they've kind of, form, not formed, but that's what happened in effect. Three of the teachers are more stylistically or whatever, and they're closer, and the other three are closer. So the kids were thriving, and it was great, um, but I think they could have gotten more out of it if they had more of a team mm -hmm. unity that you seem to have. I don't know if it's because they were doing it longer or there were more veteran teachers, you know what I'm saying? But it was still, they were doing very well, but I didn't sense that they have quite yeah. the feel mm -hmm. that you have. They don't I, need, you know. Yeah, I think, I think this year, I've been here now three years. Yeah. I think this year I've seen our teams just grow so much stronger. Like yeah. I've seen the teams working so well, communicating with each other. Yeah. And I think we've really built really strong teams. Yeah. I, I can say critical, that, really. and I think it's critical, it especially is. with this type of model. Yep. You have to have strong teams that communicate right. with each other. Yeah. And I can say that I see that happening in our in the building. Yep. And I and it, I think again, that's why we're seeing improvements in our data, whether it's discipline or academic data. Yep. I agree 100. So, yeah, I have just a a, a teacher question. Did your um, students take the ELA and the math online this year? Mm -mm. No. They did not. Okay. Next year, it starts in fifth, I think, right? Okay. Anyone else? Okay, I just have one other question. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, for those of you that have the new furniture in your classroom, what is what have you seen in terms of the effect of that on the teaching environment? In my room, incredible. Um, <laughs> Before we were in desks, and I tried to group the desks as best I could, but of course they're like all uneven nice. as far as like height and stuff like that, and shaped a little different, but it doesn't make it easy to set it up. With the new tables that I have, I can set up an experiment, it can be set up all day, it sits there, the kids come in and out, um, and then I have flexible seating. So my chairs are all on wheels, and they can move from one table to the other. We have cushions around the room that now we can sit on, and even we have furniture out in the hallway that when 
we do our group projects and they go out into the hallway, they can sit flexibly out there too. Mm -hmm. So I I love it. <laughs> In the, it. It's like unheard of for special ed to have matching set of furniture <laughs> because we always get what's left over because we're moving around all the time. And um, I was happily surprised that what I ordered came with me to the elementary school and the kids love it. They, they take care of the room even better now. Um, they know they have new stuff. They were excited when they came back from vacation to have new things. They love the chairs. And they wiggle in the chairs, and yeah. they're not bothered anymore. They, you know, they can't swing around in circles like they sometimes <laughs> want to. But um, it, it's a built-in flexibility for them. And I have some really tall sixth graders with me, and they can adjust their desks and chairs to fit themselves. Where I had one kid that just, even in a, an adult chair, he wasn't comfortable because it just didn't fit. And, you know, we can unlock the wheels, we can shove around all different configurations. It's, it's amazing. But the, the thing I think they love the most are the tables that you can write on. They're whiteboard tables, and then you can flip them up to be a whiteboard as well. Oh. Ask them to do math on paper. Yeah. That's not any fun. But get to go over and write on Mr. Fowler's table or Mrs. Rotolo's table yeah. and do math on the table. Hello. They're all over Super it because they get to use the markers and then maybe they'll draw a little picture. But it's motivating <laughs> because it's something different and they love it. They just love it. Thank you so much. All right, well, you know, it's very, it's very exciting to hear what's going on. And thank you so much for your effort. And thank you for coming this evening to, to tell us. Thanks for having us. What's your name? Aiden. Aiden? And you're new to our school, right? Yeah. What grade are you in? First. First. And what do you like about having different teachers during the school day? Like you change, you have Mrs. James, Mrs. Al, and Mrs. Stone. Well, I have done it once uh -huh. in my school before. <laughs> and like, um, I have done it once before in my school, like, we were doing like a project and like learning about different countries and I needed to go to like all the schools around me, mm -hmm. all like the rooms around me. And we changed schools actually to the big kids school to watch a movie, okay. a movie theater. Um, <laughs> but I like it. You like it? Yeah. You like changing teachers? Yeah. And Is then, there anything that you, would, that you don't like about it? No. No? Would you rather have one teacher during the day or different teachers during the day? Different. Different? Yeah, like, like, um, one, like, what if, because, like, I love this new school, because, like, it, it, we were just hatching duck right when I got here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you love it? Yeah. Good. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Can you tell me what your name is? Lily. And what grade are you in? First. Okay. And can you tell me, what do you like about having different teachers during your school day? <laughs> I like seeing all the teachers. You like seeing all the teachers? What, do, is there anything that you don't like about it? No? Would you rather go back to having one teacher during the day? Or do you like having different teachers during the day? Different. Different teachers during the day? Is there anything that you would change? No? Okay, awesome. Thank you. And that's a quote from Mrs. Lindsay Hodge. Um, she was very, when Romy went to first grade, very she shy. was very yeah, shy and did, was sure. apprehensive yeah. about going, yeah. doing this model. But now she loves that, like, yeah. Romy loves it, and so does she. You've seen a confident. Okay, tell me what your names are. Cameron, Lydia. What grade are you in? Second. Awesome. Okay, can you tell me, what do you like about having different teachers during the day? Happy. You're happy? What What do you like about it? I like, it's, I like how it's, like, really fun, and we get to get teached. Okay, <laughs> and... we get to do... That grammar <laughs> Okay. Yeah. And what's one thing? What is there anything that you would change about it? No. No. And would you rather have one teacher or more than one teacher? More than one teacher. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Tell me your name. Gabriel. 
Okay, what grade are you in? Third. Okay, what do you like about changing classes, like having different teachers that teach you different um, subject areas? I just like it probably because I'll learn more so I can reach my goal being a doctor. Oh, okay. Is there anything that you would do differently with your school day? Um, probably be a little bit more organized because my headphones always <laughs> get lost and then they're in there. <laughs> okay. Do you prefer having different teachers during the day or do, would you rather have one teacher all day? Different teachers. Different teachers? Okay, awesome. Thank you. What's your name? Aiden. What grade are you in? I'm in third. Third? Okay. What do you He's like happy. about having different <laughs> teachers during the school day? I like learning about different subjects. You do? Stuff. Okay. Is there anything that you would do differently? I'll have free time on Fridays. <laughs> free time on Fridays? Okay. Do you prefer so having one awesome. teacher throughout the day or do you I like having it. the different teachers? Different teachers throughout the day. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, what's your name? Gemma. Mm -hmm. What grade are you in? Fourth. Okay, what do you like about departmentalization, about having different teachers during the day? Um, I think it's fun that we get to see different teachers, and because I love my teachers in my school so much, um, oh. I love being able to show my different teachers. Okay, and what would you do differently? Is there anything that you would do differently? Um, I don't think so. No? Would you rather have one teacher during the day or three? All three. All three? Okay, awesome. Thank you. Hi, guys. Can you tell me what your names are? You are Bentley and Dylan. Okay, and you're in grade five, right? Yeah. Okay. Question. What do you like about departmentalization, like having different teachers teach different subject areas? Well, like, we, we go first. All right. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I like the fact that, like, you can finally be, like, done, like, with that class, and, like, you have time to, like, think about the other class without getting all nervous and stuff. Okay. Yeah, and sometimes other some teachers are better at teaching other su some subjects than other teachers. Okay. Um, I think it's like a. I think that we should just have one teacher teach all subjects. Okay. Since you don't have to go in the hallway, go into a classroom, go in the hallway, go to a classroom, go in the hallway, go to a classroom. Like that just takes longer, and you just waste more time of like school time. Okay. Why don't you just take like one teacher and then teach them how to teach all subjects. Okay. <laughs> all right. And we get to see our friends more. Like if we didn't switch around, we wouldn't be able to see our friends in the hallway, and we would be limited to just recess and the library. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Okay. Um. So if you were given the chance or the, um, if you were given the option, would you rather have? three te teachers during the day or would you rather have one teacher Eli three. okay three. One. yeah one okay <laughs> all right thanks guys yep. okay that was not in one of our classrooms <laughs> well, that was in the cafeteria yeah okay, i got that video today i did get a bunch of different videos but for the majority of them they did say they liked having the different teachers in there i did have some students that wanted to say uh stay in the same classroom i do have to say i was interviewing miss marati's kids and they wanted to stay with miss marati miss <laughs> marati is like in fourth grade, the kids wanted to stay in her classroom. She's a science and social studies <laughs> teacher. But um, overwhelmingly, they, they like departmentalization when I asked them the question. So. And those new families to the district, I wasn't familiar with a lot of them. Some of them, yeah. Some of them, yeah. Yeah, some of them. And a lot of them are new mid-year. Yeah. So it gives you that real contrast. Unusually large number? No, no not unusually large. Same yeah. kind of. Yeah. Okay. I, just, means, I like the honesty. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the fact that that one kid wasn't um, pressured into being, yeah. that had to say, yeah. Yeah. it would not yeah. be. That was yeah. good. Yeah. 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 So. All right. Well, thank you. No, thank, thank you. you.
Okay, the next point, next presentation is from our energy manager. No, they're up first. They're with, they're with the classroom and departmentalization. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. oh, yeah, they're with the furniture. Yeah. Sorry, Fran, you're. Uh, you got voted. You got voted. You're last. But you got to be here anyway. Yeah, you can't leave yet, anyhow. <laughs> any beer in the way. Sorry for false invitation. Bambi won't be out for a couple more hours. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's lucky, low. You're lucky. Uh, Chick fil A's open until like. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah, lucky. That's awful. Oh, is that the new furniture? <laughs> <laughs> Some of us do go outside. And that is what you're talking about. I want that for <laughs> better. Now we all know your password. Yeah, I know. Once you I know your are the, <laughs> the neighborhood kids. It's the same. The license plate. <laughs> I don't know what that is. So this is this is my room before before the remodel. Um, you'll just notice that I mean the the, the, the desks are chunk. They were great in their day when we had we had the laptops in there, and you can see they flip up. Um, and I liked that because um, when I didn't want them messing around on a computer, they could close it, and I had their undivided attention. Wait, I was I've been here long where we had the monitors on the table and the, you know, the towers underneath. So it's been a while. There's been a series of these kind of desks. But they, you know, they can't move. They're chunky. It, it's, kind of, it's kind of dark as well. Um, um, oh, can I go? Yeah. Just, yeah, there you go. So here's the new, here's the new desk. I think the first thing you can notice is brighter. I think it's brighter, it's airier. Um, the, the desks, are, I have them set like kind of a lecture hall, um, it, and they, they do adjust, so you can take measure outs in a little bit about that. But so this is the low, and then I have them going up, and then um, they um, they also, and this was actually before the, they put the panels on. There are panels on here now on the front, um, and they do have these, I haven't done this yet, moving them around, but they have this little notch in the corner, so you can configure them in groups. They're on wheels. Um, the chairs are on wheels. Um, these haven't been put in yet, but <laughs> but um, they have these um, power ports. So when the company left, they forgot to uh, drill the holes in the front of the desk, and the ports sit in and plug in. And then if the kids need power, they pull the, this out and lay it down, and they can plug it in. But right now, um, I do have these little, t I have towers if the kids need to plug them in, but um, these just need to be installed. Um, one other thing, well, I just wanted to, to say, um, no, yeah, you can hit the next. Um, so this is the other, my, I, have a, I have a really large room, and it was not using it to its full potential. So when I, when I call, called the company, they actually did this. I sent them pictures of my room. I didn't really know what I wanted. I, I don't do this for a living. So I sent all my, I sent them pictures of my room to the company. I had a Zoom meeting with about four or five of them and we talked about what I wanted and everything. And I had this idea that in the corner, it would be you know, an area where the kids could go and collaborate, work together. So they came up with this wonderful idea. Um, and the, these things wheel around and no longer, do I have the, 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 the laptops don't fit in the desk, so Kenny, um, then we uh, got one of these from the basement and reconfigured it so all the laptops will go in there and be charged. So it leaves it, it, leaves it free. Um, and just one of the things I want to say about, um, obviously, um, building a warm, inclusive classroom where students feel uh, like they belong is important, but I often allow my students to work together. Um, I let student become the teacher. Um, a lot of times I say things that maybe are up here and they can they can bring it down to, to student level. So, um, but 
I have, an, I have, a, I have a saying. I always say, um, uh, give the men a fish, you feed them for a day. Teach the men a fish, you feed them for a lifetime. Don't do it for them, show them how to do it. I want to see your finger pointing at the computer. I don't want to see it like this. So um, now I just say, I'm like, Andrea, teach me to fish. <laughs> so they know what I'm talking about now. Um, but, uh, and you can go ahead. And so here is, so here's the kids working um, as my business law class. And then here they are over in accounting. And they've got some sheets over here that they use, but they're helping each other. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say about my design, and I, I'm reading, kind of reading from what I, when I submitted my proposal, but I thought this is important. Um, the design of this room allows for flexibility for other classes. Um, for example, like a superintendent's day conference. Um, it has a lecture hall-like design and breakout area. Desks can be easily maneuvered into groups for teacher and or student activities. And I believe like this design in this massive room um, is even more versatile and put together with Phil Horner and Phil Shaw's room across the hall. Right? We, we usually call it, we call it across the street. Yeah. See, we're like a hall, we're like a street. And I'll say, well, go to the neighborhood. Go across the street. <laughs> we haven't come up with a name for our street yet, but um, with Phil Horner and Phil Shaw's room just across the street, Imagine how the two rooms together could be used on a conference day or professional development. I mean, you could move the desks around, you can use this, move from his, their room to my room, just right across the hall. And then, um, I think the, did you have a last? Yeah, and then just my um, transferable, flexible design, flexibility of the desks and chairs, the hybrid learning carts, um, cool down space, if they fit self regulation, soft seating space, collaborative. Creativity, it's a great place to have lunch. Jim Carrey came in and joined us the other day. They thought he was in the diner when we were that thing. But, um, and just, just for FYI, there's 22 seats with the tall tables and about a dozen seating over in the cushy. And um, thanks to Mr. Patino and Mrs. Rose, um, I mean, my one class is of, of counting kids is, is like 20. So I haven't had that in several years. So I'm very thankful to have that. Um, and I have two sections of accounting, and I haven't had that in a long time. So it looks like I can have my college accounting next year because I'll have enough kids to run it. So I'm hope hopeful for that. So again, the kids are really excited to see it come in. They just like, mm, you know, this is cool. This is awesome. And they make them want to be there. Makes them want to work. And then they'll always, they'll always say, can we go work on the couch? Sure. You know, when they're working independently. Usually ask questions. What have you? What, what? <laughs> what do you see? <laughs> what have you seen in terms of any difference in the students since this new configuration? Well, I, they they help each other a lot more. I mean, they, I I'm sitting. I might be of them because they're working independently, and I'm at my desk, and I'm like, you know, let me know when you need me. But then I'll I'll hear them. Oh, we got oh, we got to debit that. No. Well, we get, so I hear them talk. So wonderful, it's, you know. Over whether on the, they're on the couches or they're just sitting next to each other. The old, the old desk didn't matter what I do. I, I either couldn't open them or I couldn't close them. Yes. And that, or you, well, they you walk in my room and all of a sudden the they ding, pop they pop up, and yeah. now you got the computer up there. This just seems like the kids come in and they're working. They get right to work. Yeah. And yeah, we did. There was a there was hinge problems, so they a lot of times they're like trying to close yeah, them. It's terrible. terrible. So and then they, they can to get like right slam it. And I'm like, I'm not gonna slam it. So so it just seems to be much more. And I said brighter area, mm -hmm. yeah. easier yeah. to move around mm -hmm. in. So mine's look, mine's not as flawless. <laughs> was not, mine's like chaos. Okay. Yeah, you know, if they need to find anything. They come to my room. So I took a video like before we were moving out. Um, like, no, I don't think I did a teacher desk. So I'm like, you know, just stuff and whatever piecemeal, like Don Lee said, we just kind of piecemeal. Oh, those desks, the, the octagon tables, they always came from the old high school down. We salvaged them from I the old library. My dad. <laughs> you know? So this was kind of like when I first was able to get the new furniture into the room. Again, still a little stuff. I kept some of those because those are like the rocky cushion chairs. But I've got 
um, collaboration, high tables, low tables. Um, and then this area over here is like the high tables with the, the cushions, but then they've got the whiteboard. So it's not, it could be me over there teaching, or I have, uh, sometimes I co-teach in my room. So we use that little area, or it's the kids working in three and they've got the whiteboard to kind of to work on. These, so here's a high table with collaboration going on. The pods, I wanted the pods. I think I'm the only one besides the cafeteria that's got the high um, wall lights. Mm -hmm. The distraction, so it's like, it's like the old time carols, but it's it's functional. It's 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 real life that you know. I had a student the other. When, I, when am I getting my flapjacks? You know that he thinks it's like, um, yeah, <laughs> like that, right? But I can have a conversation with a student. I have a, a dual pod, and then I've got two singles. So they tend to go work in their singles, and then they're not distracted by something else going on in the classroom. So I'm, I'm getting more out of students than I've ever gotten. Because normally, they like to be in everybody else's business. Now they're not. Or if I need to, if I need to, I have a rolling chair that goes between all three of them. So I can, you know, pull up and work with her. Or I can slide down. Or there's two, I, I have several students who sit together because they're in the same classes and they're talking about American history. That's perfect for you know, special ed. It, it, it really is. It, it, you know, and I didn't know exactly how it would fit in the room, and I just went with it this way. Um, because I, my desk is in the center of the room, so I can see kind of what they're doing and if they need help or whatever, but it's, it's, it's real life. It's not putting them with, you know, we, had, we used to have the, uh, the trifold. To put around yep. so they wouldn't be distracted or board yep. the poster board between them. And this, the minute I saw those, I go, no, nope. <laughs> getting those. And um, I have I have students that come in from all. And then lunch, Tracy and I have lunch in here sometimes, or we go down to the Mr. Warner, Mr. Shaw's room. Mm -hmm. We kind of, you know, it helps us take a break as well sure. from the um, classrooms. So yeah, the, the pods. So I, I push into a lot of classrooms. I see a lot of different things. I'm in the library. If you haven't been to the library, if you haven't been to the mega room, I didn't post those in here. But this is the math room before. This is, um, and, and like you said, the desks aren't even. So even when you're trying to make a table of three or a station or whatever, it doesn't, it doesn't flow very well. <laughs> now we've got the desks. They fit all size students. You know, we've got some some tall kids, some short, you know, all different sizes. That's, these chairs are on wheels. They know, again, movement wise, they don't have to wheel all the way across to the, um, the room, but they could if they needed to. Those are the, those are the white erased. And then those are the tables, the whiteboard. It's a learning curve with the whiteboard. Um, tables, we're um, running out of expo marker, dry erase markers <laughs> left and right. Do you, you know, do you store them this way, this way, flat? Well, now we're going flat, you know, so because, you know, Miss Adams is buying them every week. Um, but they can do, um, you know, the math right on, on the whiteboard. Um, I, I have it at the end, but the communication, like I had a student that sat down and she wrote a little note down there and she just needed, you know, Three minutes. Just leave me alone. Something happened in the hallway. Three minutes. And that's all she said. I just need three minutes. So we all knew. We just walked away from her. We came back and we were able to sit down with her after the break, you know, and, and work through it. She didn't have to leave. She didn't, you know, but it was a short little communication. Um, the, the kids know, this is one of the, the, ma the other math room. Kids know when they're like this, ooh, they're taking a test. But there are all different configurations that you can do with these things. You can put them in three, fours. You can put a, a teacher in the middle or a student in the middle, and they can spin and work. I mean, it's just, it's endless. Um, with, yeah, with these, the, the vertical whiteboards. So Carolyn's room, which was the room before that, she has a shorter one, and it's yellow, bright yellow. All the kids were just kind of like, all right, well, they're not motivated. She's like, all right, here we go. She grabs that thing, and out the door we go, and we're in the hallway now, and she's like, all right, we're gonna solve this on here. So they're they're mobile. They can go anywhere. Is that um, side with one? It, it, 
what was that? I think she was outside with one. Yeah, it, it, right. You just grab and go, and here we go. And this this classroom, um, the they they can work on both sides. They can choose to work at the desk with the whiteboards. Um, so yeah, this is Miss Dora's room, and she always does multiple different styles with it. Um, this was um, in the English room. They have these reading um, beanbag chairs. So. I was like, you're going to do an independent reading book close to the end of the school year? Are you kidding me? Every kid read an independent reading book because they could get in a comfy spot. They also, you know, in the library, comfy spot, you know, it wasn't just sitting at the desk normally, you know, flip the page like this. Um, they shared, like if somebody wanted the beanbag, but then the next day they went to the couch. Um, it just seems to be so much more, it appears to be more learning. And like I said, English 12, they all read an independent you know, book before the end of the year and they did a one pager. And I was like, oh my God, I couldn't believe it. And they all got up and were able to present it. So yeah, I'm seeing in increased collaboration, the movement, whether it's physically moving or just they need to rock or move or sway or you know, whatever it is, and it's, it's not noisy. And, and it's not disrupting anybody else. Um, oh, with the white, with the white boards, like a brain break. All right, play tic tac toe for the person next to you. Or hey, Wordle's up there. You know, history guys always do Wordle, so they get the on the white boards. They have them as well as white tables. You know, kids can try and write out the alphabet and then figure out which letter they want to choose. It's endless. You know, the Venn diagrams, pros and cons. Um, sentence starters. All right, who's going to start? You know, just it's just endless on what can happen, and I love it because I, I can't believe I just said that. I go into multiple classrooms. <laughs> I recorded it. So I know. Uh, like so, I might see something happen in one classroom with whether it's the technology, whether it's the type of of uh, lesson or learning or whatever it is, the furniture, then I go to another room and I'm like, hmm, I wonder if that'll work in here, or we have, you know, we're having trouble with this. What do you think about if we do this? And I'm like, oh, I, I, and I saw this in Miss Bata's room, or whatever. It just seems to be, you know, everybody's willing to try and do and, and, and make it so much better. So do you think the kids are happier? Yes. They yeah. do like they do like change. Like they yeah. let they like when they came in and they were like, oh, "This is cool," you know. Yeah. So, and they do. They, they, daily yeah. they'll say, "Can we go? Can we go work on the couches?" And they're like, "No, today's not a couch day." <laughs> you gotta save your teeth. Yeah. It's not an everyday thing. Mm -hmm. Just when you're working independently. Um, and do you think there's a good shelf life on the, the furniture? I mean, as veteran teachers, someday someone well, might come in we your space and is this something they could kind Seriously, of... we were shocked when we saw like the, the cafeteria and like, ooh, I don't know, how long before the students. No, I don't think we've had to replace anything and that's And I, mean, I and I've seen some, you know, bucking on furniture yes. <laughs> while you're in there, but it's old enough. And yeah. yeah, I mean really I think they are taking pride in it as well. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, but it's it's good. It's great. And it, it just again, I, I like the light and the brightness of it. Yeah, that that it created in my room. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we're and we're working on the testing situation because you know if we're we're teaching kids this way and they're taking their assessments this way during the school day, how are we going to do it for the state test? So I think we're working on that. And it's got you know a breakout. We're calling them breakout rooms, but it's everybody's in a breakout room. It's not just not the special ed students going into you know have a test read in here and you know. So it's, it's where they're going to be comfortable to do the best they can on the assessments that they're, that they're given. So our, our neighborhood is almost done. I'm hoping Mr. Parker puts in for his. So he's in our, he's where um, well, I took one. Mr. Smith's yeah. room and whatnot. So question-wise, I, I, you know, if you haven't seen all of the different ones, take a walk around. The library is endless as well. Um, you know. Thank you. Thanks. All right, thanks. Okay, now you're on. I promise. <laughs> oh, hold on, Laura, you got to go first.
working? Okay. Yeah. So I'm Fran D'Ambrosio, and I am the district energy manager. Uh, the district is involved in the development and implementation of an energy master plan. And this involves an energy management plan with a subpart of the electric bus fleet conversion, funding for decarbonization and alternative energy projects, along with the electric bus fleet conversion, and an energy curriculum for grades 7 through 12 in the STEM program. The energy management plan, hang on, my first one here. Right. So we're supposed to, we're here to uh, assess the current energy use, set and commit energy goals and a policy, create an energy team of 12 members. Currently, we only have 10, but we're still searching. Identify strategies and technologies that fit our district. Create an energy management action plan, which is basically a roadmap of how we're going to get from where we are to where we need to be or shoot to be. Execute that plan and finally acknowledge the accomplishments through milestones. This relates to assessment of the current energy use and walkthrough audits. This is a, a sample of a visual representation of what the walkthrough audits at the buildings has revealed. This covers topics like missing or damaged ceiling tiles, uh, envelope seal problems like window seals and door seals, uh, control devices for lights and HVAC, uh, devices that control Electronics, we have plug load controllers, which have been people have changed rooms throughout the years and have moved their equipment throughout the years, so these devices have been abandoned. I'm currently redeploying those. Uh, any um, mechanical devices like pumps and actuators, things that control the heat, they all have controls put on them, so I've been reviewing to see what's been in good shape and what isn't. And finally, there's a redundant use of appliances building so but that's uh that would be a district decision and not my decision <laughs> next we have the uh, energy utilization index which basically compares the three buildings at the school to other buildings across the nation the high school uh, at is in the green which is good it's the newest building so it makes sense the east hill school which is Pretty far out of whack, the oldest building, the oldest systems, uh, again, makes sense. The bus garage is in a weird area because uh, the benchmark is for mechanical services buildings, but we also have attached a large storage facility. Uh, this is an uninsulated steel building, so it's, it's hard to be efficient on the plus side, probably in the next uh, slide or so. <clears throat> we'll see that the bus garage really isn't that important in the whole scope of the picture. <clears throat> this is our baseline for 2022, and this is what we'll, we'll be comparing progress against. So the electrical, which is the two tallest bars, is pretty even between the high school and East Hill building. Uh, the gas usage, the East Hill building is on the far right. As you can see, the gas usage is quite a bit higher than it is at the high school. Again, it points out that the focus should be at East Hill to try to make major changes. This is also where the concept of the geothermal uh, heat pump system to add over there came into play last year or so. This is an actual comparison between the baseline and this first quarter of the energy use. You can see here there's a slight difference uh, it's a little lower this year than it was last year. This is the actual data for that situation. So we're about $6,000 less in expenditures this year for the first quarter than we were last year. The main, there's two main reasons for this. One is heating degree days, which is related to a milder winter this year than last year. And the second part is corrective actions, which have been taken by the facilities director uh, and implemented myself when I was uh, the building maintenance worker. So under his direction, we did a lot of repairs that actually made some difference. So the heating degree days is about 75% of this number, the $6,000 number. 
and the corrective actions is about 25 percent savings in that number. And what was the total expense for the energy for last year? Yeah, uh, I believe it was about 250 somewhere in that area. Yeah, 250,000. Yes, yes, sir. I can get you that exact number, but I don't. I don't have. No, it. just I, I just wanted a ballpark. Yeah, it's yeah, two fifty. It's somewhere two fifty, two seventy, somewhere in that area. It's pretty high. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is the roadmap for decarbonization and alternatives. So this is basically the plan on what the district needs to do to achieve major goals. Uh, and these are also realistic, attainable goals. Uh, you could say, yeah, let's change everything at the high school, but you know, you're going to spend millions and you're going to get back hundreds of thousands. So it's just not going to happen. So initially, we'd like to study air source heat pumps for the transportation facility. What this would do would be decarbonize the transportation facility and convert uh, fully to electric up there. It would eliminate any natural gas usage. Along with that, we could add solar, which would offset the um, increase in electrical demand from the, uh, from the heat pumps. And in conjunction with that, we're going to add the electric buses. So the electrical demand is going to go up even more. So we need to offset that with solar. Mm -hmm. Part of that, step two, to get the funding and start to implement that, reinstate the heat pump system over at uh, East Hill, the geothermal system, which again would decarbonize, it reduces the use of gas, converts the use to electricity. Uh, a little bit further down the road, we need to add more solar to offset that electricity. Uh, let's see, number three, where are we in? It also adds cooling to the elementary school, the geothermal portion does, and it would also add cooling to the bus garage. And when we start to charge buses there, if we do actually get to converting a full fleet there, a byproduct of electricity is heat generation. So we may actually need to cool the bus garage to get everything uh, to charge correctly and run correctly without an excessive amount of heat, without leaving the doors open all night. So we don't want to do that, right? <laughs> uh, next, we would study solar PV at the middle school and um, air source heat pumps at the middle school. This would, again, reduce uh, gas loads at the middle school. And it would add cooling to the middle school, which the middle school has none right now, other than the office. Nope. Occasionally. Not there I, I, occasionally. <laughs> occasionally. Okay. Well, once a year, it adds cooling. August. <laughs> Winter. In, ja in January, right? <laughs> so uh, if we could add uh, air source heat pumps to the middle school, see the classes have a fairly low ceiling, and the classrooms are a fairly small size. So air source heat pumps actually work well over there as compared to elementary school where geothermal is a, is a better fit because of the size of the classes and the ceiling heights. So next, again, some funding. Well, what this does is it's going to putting air source, first of all, putting geo at uh, the elementary school reduces boiler loads on the steam boilers at East Hill. It converts it to electrical. Second, if we do air source at the middle school, that reduces <laughs> boiler loads uh, that are in the, in the Nellis. So that reduces that load. With the offset from East Hill being a less demand, we actually could switch any remaining heat that was required through boilers from middle school over to East Hill and would potentially totally eliminate the two massive boilers at Nellis, which would be a substantial savings. After that, um, it basically boils down to improvements. So we could change the steam. The steam is a very old system. You know, it's a very inefficient way to, we're taking steam to heat hot water. You know, we're not running steam heat anymore. We just run take steam, we heat hot water, and then we run hot water through the building. So we've got a step in there that can be totally eliminated. So if we could put efficient hot water boilers in East Hill, then it would, it would save even more. Uh, and then, of course, like I said, we could remove the Nellis boilers completely, and um, that would basically bring us to all the reasonably attainable decarbonization and alternatives that we could, we could expect uh, on this roadmap. I know I'm rushing through this a bit, but uh, you know 
I'll answer any questions. If you have any now, I'll answer them. Or... Does wind have any value in any anymore? I mean, we have glacious wind. I know we do have wind. glacious wind. I do. haven't done much research on it. Um, in my past experiences, there's usually a lot of um, obstruction to it because A, the size of the towers, they do generate noise uh, mm -hmm. when they generate power. Mm -hmm. um, so you really have to have, if it was off property, mm -hmm. I'd say, yeah, if we could tap into someone that has a wind farm and maybe buy some of that energy, I would say yes. But on property, uh, we just, I just don't think not it's the gonna, best, uh, not the best fit here. Uh, I've conferred with National Grid to get a fleet assessment report as far as the bus fleet on what the infrastructure side, what National Grid can support and, and where we stand. We're actually in pretty good shape except that uh, the bus garage will not handle a full fleet conversion. There's just not enough power there to do it. But that doesn't mean that we can't start the fleet and meet the mandate which begins in 2027. Uh, it just may require some progress or by the time we progress the grid may actually take care of that problem on their own side so there's a lot of incentives for the grid to do this work and move ahead so um, we would see we would have to see where that goes but we could start and and uh, move ahead with an electric bus also this report showed that the cost of charging a full fleet would actually cost us more in electricity than it we currently pay in fuel for the for the buses. So that supports the fact that we're going to have to have solar to offset this situation. There's, we're going to have to do it. Uh, otherwise, we're just going to lose. You know, it's, it's not sustainable. We're just going to go further and further, further behind, and it just it won't get there. Uh, I currently have a fleet assessment. Uh, directly related to the bus, which just calculates the routes and the charging required and the types of charger for each one of the buses because they all have separate routes. They're going to require separate charging rates, separate times. They sit, it's called a dwell time for different lengths of time. So once I get all that information, I can send that back to National Grid and get a more accurate number. Um, and it may show that the bus garage can actually support full charge. We may be ready at this point. Uh, but this was a preliminary report, so, uh, you know, they took high numbers. It's, it's a very broad, broad estimate. I have to mention with the bus uh, thing that uh, we have two different uh, initiatives going on. We have the funding initiative and we have the state mandate. So they're really two different uh, focuses. The funding is focused on pre-2009 buses and earlier. Uh, they have part of the getting the funding is to scrap early buses to, you know, to get them off the road so that when you get a new electric bus you've actually made a difference. We don't have any. We lease the buses. We actually run, this year we'll be running 2024 buses. Okay, So the funding is really not focused on our fleet and the proactiveness of the district to maintain current product. At 2024 we are about 90% more uh, emissions efficient than the buses they're trying to get rid of. So we're really at the cutting edge, even though we're not electric. Uh, on top of that, the mandate is just a blanket. This is what you're going to do regardless if you're proactive, regardless if you're running the most efficient vehicle on the road. It's just, you know, it's just a whole, it's a total different thing. So maybe some time, if we can start the fleet, get a few buses, meet the mandate, uh, there'll be some common ground between the mandate and the funding. And, uh, and it would fit us a little better. Next is project financing. So how do we fund uh, all of these projects and all of these ideas? So we have grant source, which is pretty simple. We're just researching and writing grants and try to get some money to take care of things. Uh, there's project source, which is usually a power purchase agreement, which only pertains to solar because they have to have something to sell us, uh, which would be power generation in order for a power purchase agreement to work. What that does is they, the a company or a, a contractor would come in and put solar, 
they would absorb all the costs, they put it all in, and they would sell us electricity. So say we paid 12 cents now, they may sell it to us for 9 cents for the next 20 years. There is a savings, there is a plus that we don't have the responsibility of the system. Uh, we don't have to worry about at the end of 20 years what happens to the system. Uh, but the savings is not, uh, you know, grand. You know, it's just a little bit, but it is budgetable. Uh, next, we have contract source, which is basically an EPC, which is an energy performance contract, which is the last lighting uh, and controls project that was done at the district was an EPC. What that does is it takes the savings that are generated through doing the project to pay back the cost of the project. And once the project is paid for, all those uh, profits or savings after that become ours wholly to keep. Then there's cost sharing, which is capital outlay and capital projects. Uh, our portion is about 10%, uh, and as it stands right now, with the next project and future projects, that's pretty much encumbered. So I don't think we really can look at that to do many of the projects I'm looking at doing. And then finally, there's leveraging, which is just combining any number of these options to get the full amount needed to do a project. It could be some grants, uh, some uh, performance contracts, you know, some cost sharing, whatever, but uh, and we try to get that somehow. This is the American Made Energy Champions leading the advancement of sustainable schools <laughs> class official prize. So prior to A -N -I -E -C -L -A -S. Uh, yeah, I don't know where the last that oh there it is. Schools, yeah. So prior to my appointment, I did some research for my interview and stumbled across this. Um, this was due by the second week of my physician appointment, so I rushed to get it done with the help of Dr. Fitzgerald, of course, and uh, got this turned in, and we actually received the award. So there's 25 of these across the nation, and uh, we were able to receive that. The purpose of that was to extend the on-site energy manager um, services for another year. So the district can now receive the services of the, of the position that I'm filling uh, for another year, which is good. It's, it's only going to help get us further to where we go, and it's at basically no cost to the district. I'm sure there's some small incidental costs that I'm not aware of, but still good, good. It's a win-win, I think. Next, we just recently reviewed a preliminary project for uh, solar um, through Johnson Controls, which is the company that initially looked at doing the solar here that got turned down because of infrastructure inadequacies. There wasn't enough uh, transformer and substation capacity. Things have changed since then, so we decided to ask them to take another look. They took another look. They think it's uh, doable. Uh, in a preliminary phase, they think this is actually something that's attainable. They presented it as uh, an EPC, uh, which means that we have to pay it back, but it's basically no money up front again for us. So they front the money, they charge us an interest fee, we pay it back with our savings. At the end of the project, we get 100% of the savings. So this turns out to be an 18 year payback. A positive cash flow of $1.7 million over those 18 years. A total project cost of $2.8 million over those 18 years. An annual savings of $128,000 a year for the district. And a building A ratio of 81.4%. Now, that 81.4 is without referendum. If we went to public referendum, we could achieve, I believe, about 90%. On the eight ratio, uh, and we also receive uh, a half a million in uh, aid and uh, incentives from the last. That's year. what's changed too. The incentives have gone up since the last time we looked at it. Yes, the incentives have gone up, and uh, and just tapping into the grid is yeah yeah. And we're able to do that from last okay, time. If we're able, right? So the next, I just spoke with um, the representative yesterday. Uh, you know, there's a there's a moratorium here. Uh, right now and um, the reason for the moratorium really has a lot to do with the PPA style program uh, as where the power that being generated here locally is 
may not even be produced here locally. Uh, we may have an advantage because of this moratorium. A, the fact that we would put the solar on school property. B, that the school would 100% receive the electricity and therefore the community would 100% receive the benefits of this electricity. So this moratorium may have allowed us to stop them, the large projects, from moving forward and giving us a spot to put our foot in line to get our meal ticket so that we're next to get on the national grid, uh, uh, you know, improvements. So it, it, it could work out. Um, Johnson Controls and Solar Liberty, who's the company that did our educational system out back, the two, the two panel array out back. Uh, of course, I'll get it in writing but they have conveyed to me that they were willing to take the initial um, costs on their half of doing uh, approaching national grid to get the initial uh, survey done through them. It's a few thousand dollars for each of those businesses, but because of their investment so far, they're willing to continue to invest a little more. Uh, like I said, of course, I would try to get that, get that in an email, right? <laughs> Any questions on this? On the, on the yeah, go ahead. Okay, well, a number of things. Uh, yeah. One is about seven years ago, um, we had a contract signed and sealed to have a solar system installed here on the yeah, solar cool. city. Um, and we had the contract signed and it was all ready to go. And then the infrastructure question came up. Right. And I was going to add $3 million to the equation and a system that was going to save us money all of a sudden became a loser Correct. and so we that fell through um so i would just say that based on that experience which was extremely disappointing um that we should be very very certain that the infrastructure part is included in whatever you know thing is being worked out with johnson's uh, you know johnson or whoever yes. that we're working with because that came after the after, it was science field and delivered and all of a sudden, we got this, this you know, shot out of left field. We're not going at it from that direction. We're going at it. We're starting at the infrastructure. We're making sure that this works before we continue to go ahead and invest anything in it. Yeah. So that's definitely the avenue we will we will be taking. And uh, the other question I just had is, what kind of time? You know, based on the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and all that, with a lot of, you know, uh, yeah. sustainable. Uh, money available, you know, for renewable energy. Um, is, are we tapping, are we able to tap into any of that to help offset some of the costs? Uh, some of the ins ins incentives is actually from the, the Inflation Reduction Act, and it's a direct pay tax credit. It just gets paid directly to the district. So some of that is that. But, uh, of course, I will be pursuing grants uh, to try to either offset this project or any of the other projects uh, on an EPC. If we can throw in, you know, even 25%, that may change our annual from $130,000 to $150,000 or maybe even $200,000, depending on the award, right? Just increase our end of the savings and the less we have to pay out for the project. So I am always pursuing funds to try to get any of these projects done uh, at its least cost to the district as possible. Um, just one last question. Any concept of time frame of when we might start to see some of the solar or the geothermal or anything? Well, that? the uh, track two for NYSERDA's geothermal uh, is to be determined, I've been told, but it's expected to open up at the beginning of next year. So we're looking at January. At that point, we would need to have our submittal adjusted, edited, and ready to go back in. Uh, and that was through uh, SEI. Uh, who was our architect. Uh, they're the ones that submitted it last time. I did speak with the NYSERDA representative and discuss the list of strengths and weaknesses and we'll be addressing, personally, uh, editing and addressing the weak areas uh, so that we have a better chance. We were in the top 50% uh, on the last round that we did not make it through. Uh, so, you know, I, I think we got a very good shot next time, but, you know, you just never know. Sometimes parameters change or guidelines change. Uh, just like the school bus program, the first uh, clean school bus round basically was a lottery. This time it is a uh, grant with a minimum request of 15 buses. 
So yeah. although it sounds grandiose, yeah. we, can, can't we can't even charge. We, that's a complete fleet change for us. We can't even do it. So we have to pass this situation by. Now maybe, school stuff. maybe between the first, uh, the first one being a lottery and the second one being a 15 bus minimum, maybe the third round will be somewhere in the middle where we can get five buses and, you know, and it's a lottery. I don't know, you know, so we'll see. But, uh, you know, the time's got to progress on. Unfortunately, that opportunity is, is not for us at this, at this point. So. And how about the time frame for solar? You know, again, I, I know you can't give a definite time. I, I, can't, I can't. I really don't have a time frame, but I would guess and say that if we strike now and if Johnson Controls and Solar Liberty is willing to put in a little money, like they said they would, uh, for these uh, to see if the grid is capable, um, I would say within a year we probably could have bids out. And uh, was the board okay with us moving forward to look at the solar? Well, you know my answer. I know. <laughs> It's actually positive cash flow by eighty thousand a year, yeah. like cash. And that's, and that's what the original one was yeah. was supposed to generate. Right. That's with nothing out of our pockets. Yeah. So uh, I can explain the fields just a little bit. Um, these numbers are generated on the best ROI that they can do. Right? They're going to do that. They're not going to give us the worst and and you know try to make it look good. They want to sell us this. So so what that means is that they're looking for the least amount of development in the property, which puts us at the field in front of the bus garage. It is built ready today. It gives us a short interconnection. We're about 60 feet from the interconnection of a system on that field to National Grid's infrastructure. It's very good. So, uh, and it's also of the fields they provo uh, proposed, it is the largest, uh, there's two that are exact same size, but that's the largest field. Other proposals are for the hill, which is where the original proposal was behind the baseball field. Uh, and I had also had them look at the triangle between Carlisle and Cunningham behind the baseball field, uh, which is to us is unused, unused land. But the hill requires uh, site modification. The hill's interconnection is from that hill all the way to behind the maintenance area at the high school. So you've added considerable cost in trenching and running cable service from the hill to here. Uh, and the Cunningham Triangle field was about 68% of our current load, as were these other two fields that are 84%. So the Cunningham one was smaller. I do think that the Cunningham uh, area could be increased in size. Uh, I'm not sure why they made it only 68%. It looks like there's enough land there to make it larger. Uh, and the, inter the interconnection is on Cunningham Road. Again, it's only about 60 feet, uh, but the site is very wet, and it does have, it's been fallow, so there's some growth, uh, so there's some site preparation that would have to be done there. Um, but it may turn out that a 68% field uh, may cost-wise, right, because a smaller field, smaller price, smaller payback, uh, it, it may actually work, but I see it right now as being in front of the bus garage uh, on, the, on the grass there. So. Are we okay? Anything you else? guys agree with going moving forward? Yeah. I mean, nothing you'd have, we have to finalize anything. Yeah. yeah, there's no, yeah. The only thing, like I said, I would get in writing from these companies that it's no cost. Everything I'm trying to do so far has cost us nothing, right? I've gotten bids, proposals, uh, estimates, you know, uh, advice, all these things have been working diligently at, at costing us zero, so. And Johnson Controls is extremely excited about this project. So they've, yes. they've got some things in the works that they know this can work. I mean, they're kind of jumping through their skin to, to get this moving, so. Good. Okay, anyone, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you, good luck, and keep I us posted. final area, unless you guys want to go home. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Remember, Chick-fil-A, so. That's my way home. All right, finally, we have the energy curriculum. So this involves concepts for the middle school STEM classes and careers for the high school uh, STEM classes. At the middle school, we have discussed what energy is, uh, what we, where, how do we make it, and what do we use it for. And we've also discussed uh, the difference between renewable and non-renewable uh, 
sources of energy. So we're exposing the students to what's going on with energy. Uh, it's, it's been pretty good. I'm actually ahead of schedule. I did my second class Wednesday. It was supposed to be my first class, first class so we're actually ahead of schedule there. And then for the high school, the uh, solar educational system that we have out back, no one has had the programming, uh, so no one really knew how to study it or look up what it's producing or teach the students about it. So I've taken the initiative to do that. I've taken the students out, exposed them to that situation. We learned about it, uh, what it can do, and uh, the different careers involved. So it's everything from computers and microprocessors to uh, masons and welders. So, uh, you know, uh, we went through that and that, that went pretty well. So the next uh, class for the, for the high school is to uh, actually have them design a system uh, using the information that our system produces, uh, you know, how many megawatts a year it's produced, physically how big is it, design a system for their own home or any property that that they can find and look at uh, either a generic national grid bill or their own national grid bill to uh, calculate what the return on investment, what the payback period would be for their own system. So. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry for watching. Well, I, I can tell you, I have solar and geothermal at our house. Okay. And I have zero electric bill and right. zero fuel bill. So well, it's a very goal, good right? situation to be in right now. Well, I, we can't do that here. We can't get to zero. You know, we, we're going to have to, uh, you know, the school runs 24-7, right? We've got cleaners at night and everything else. So we're going to be on the grid at least at night. Uh, the only avenue around that is storage, you know, battery storage. Uh, but uh, I just don't think that's, that's a gag no, I, I'm just... to get into yet. So. All right. Well, thank you again. Right, no, thank you. It's been a pleasure. I hope it was educational. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. Thank you. Okay, so um, there's no other questions. Thank you very much, and, yes. and good luck going forward, for sure. <laughs> We're 100% behind you. All right, thank you. Okay, um, next thing is approvals, and we have to approve the budget vote. Motion to approve. Second. Any questions, discussion? Okay, all in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Um, we'll get on to personnel. I would entertain a motion for a consent agenda. Motion. Second. Second. All in favor? Thank you. And I just have to wait a minute for my computer to get back fired up here again. And then we can proceed. Okay, so uh, first one is accept the resignation of Amanda Rose from the position of school counselor, effective June 30. Right, any questions on that? Uh, she's, she had a letter with that that explained that, you know, she's has to move on and was very, uh, you know, grateful for her, her experience here and also sorry that she needed to leave. So, um, okay, next one C is, um, the resignation of Hiley Herc from the uh, special ed teacher. Any questions on that? Okay, then we have appoint a leave replacement teacher in the middle school, which would be uh, Morgan O'Connor. Anything there? Okay. Uh, school counselor. Um, this would be, I need my glasses. Yep. This is the, uh, um, for Amanda's position at the high school. Um, had a great interview. Um, great about this position is uh, Jan has actually worked with her in the past with HFM Bosa. And she's also gone to another school district now is in charge of scheduling 6 through 12. So she has school tool experience, AP experience. And the, uh, so, um, like we, again, I know we keep saying we get lucky. Maybe it's not lucky. We, we're drawing some great people here, and uh, uh, we're, we're in great shape because we also we know this person, we know how they work, and I got some good reference checks as well down in, down where she's currently. Well, that's great. Extremely excited to be here. Like, extremely excited to be here. So. Great. Any questions? 
Okay, moving right along, appoint a math teacher, which would be uh, Danielle Blumberg. This is taking the place of something, or is this yes. what we're adding? Taking uh, place. Mr. So we're moving. So currently in sixth grade math, we've ha we've had a K five cert or K six certified teacher. Danielle is actually finishing her five six math extensions. We're actually moving a math content specialist to sixth grade as opposed to a, a, a classroom generalist. So uh, she she's been great. She's been our AIS person for the year. So we're just moving her to a full time okay. tenure gotcha. position. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, elementary teacher. Uh, Carrie Powers. <laughs> Who would that be, I wonder? <laughs> okay, any questions there? Welcome. <laughs> we didn't vote yet, but I think we will. We did vote. Okay, uh, point an ENL teacher. Um, that would be Eddie Watt. This is just a real point because it's a year by year position. Right. So that's a year, a year by year? Yeah, year? because you don't know the you know, the number of students okay. that you might have. Yeah. Okay. But this is for a full time. Correct. For this coming year. Yep. And part of that so it was the budget. We had it in ARPA yeah. grants and now we're making it full time. Is that yeah. a tenure position then? It, yes, it will be. Yeah. As long as it's here mm -hmm. for that many time, that many yeah. years. Yeah. We'll convert it over once it's that. Okay. Anything else on that? Okay. And then we have a pre-K teacher temporary position. What is the story there? That's the pro that's the um, three year old program. So had um, Fullmont was running it in the building, and, and now, now we're taking they're they're yes. not they're moving that classroom. But we have enough students now. We had 14, 15. 14, 15 oh, really? that registered. So okay. we Our golden number was fourteen or fifteen, yes. and they think there's another one coming. So we should have. Yeah, we okay, think we'll great. have sixteen. Good deal. So between that, if we get 16 or more, along with the grant that we got, we pretty much come close to wiping out that debt that we had for pre-K. Remember yep. we were paying on our yeah, 20,000 yeah. hour fund balance? Yeah. Mm -hmm. our, our, our regular uh, general fund? Yeah. So. Oh, great. And have our own program. And then we have a create a temporary... Um, it's for the same class. Same we have class. Oh, that the same yeah. Yeah. Okay. Motion Alrighty. to approve. I would entertain uh, a motion to vote. <laughs> I say all in favor. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Um, I do have a thing I just want to add, just an announcement and new business. I just received a notice from uh, NISBA that they're going to be having a, uh, a leadership conference in the end of July, a two-day conference in Albany. Um, and I'll... Thank you. <laughs> but I just, uh, it's $100 per person who attends. Um, it looks like a great and, uh, and meaningful uh, agenda. And so I'll bring in more information about that in the June meeting, because I, I think it would be something that would be useful to attend. I would plan to attend it, but I think it would be great if anyone else would like to go as well. It's, I think, July 27th and 28th. And... Um, so we can talk about that a little bit. I'll, I'll put it on the agenda for the June meeting and we can, I'll have more details about it. Okay, do we need to do executive session? Yes, just real quick. Okay, I would entertain a motion to go into executive. All in favor? Thank you. Congratulations and welcome. Thank you. Okay, uh, I would like to uh, accept yes, the motion, motion to go home. Let's go. Okay.